Hey everyone, welcome back. As you can see, I have a new actuator to test on the active suspension test rig, and that's the linear voice coil motor. These are the same common type of motors you find inside of most speakers. They're very easy to manufacture. They're very responsive and unbelievably accurate. So there's a couple of different configurations for a voice coil motor, uh, depending on how you build it. Uh, the voice coil I've designed is referred to as a moving magnet voice coil motor, as opposed to a moving coil voice coil motor. In the middle, we have a magnet that's epoxy to a three millimeter carbon fiber rod. It's important the rod not be made of a magnetic material. Then around the outside of the magnets is a large coil of magnet wire. On each end, we have some 3D printed caps that guide the carbon fiber shaft and actually keep the magnets from touching the coil. And lastly, tying everything together is a thick steel tube, usually called a back iron. The back iron gives the coil magnetic flux a return path and allows the uh, VCM to be a much stronger and more efficient. The way the motor works is current passes through the coil and creates a magnetic field. Uh, the strength of that field is proportional to the amount of current and the number of coil windings. There's a range of travel for which the force created by the coil on the magnets is directly proportional to the current. This diagram shows the magnetic flux lines created by current traveling through the coil. You can see how the flux lines come out and bend around the ends of the coil. In the middle portion of the coil where the magnetic flux lines are mostly straight with respect to the magnet, the force the VCM creates is linear to the amount of current passing through the coil. But near the ends of the voice coil, the magnetic flux lines are at an angle to the magnet, so the force in these regions actually begins to diminish. So when designing a VCM, you typically make it some amount longer than the travel distance and the magnet height. In this case, my voice coil is about 40% longer than the coil plus the magnets. So making the voice coil motor is fairly straightforward. I did 3D print a couple of jigs just to make the uh, VCM more accurate and efficient. One jig holds the magnets perfectly centered on the carbon fiber rod while they're being epoxied. And then I created a two-piece bobbin on which to wind the magnet wire, uh, which is held together with a quarter inch bolt. To make the coil, I wrapped the bobbin in cellophane tape so that I could release the two halves of the bobbin later. I also coated the ends with a small amount of Vaseline or petroleum jelly. I then fed one end of the magnet wire through a hole that I have at the top of the bobbin just to hold the wire in place. I then chuck the bolt uh, with the bobbin on it into my drill and then as slowly as possible while tension in the wire with one hand I begin to wrap the wire around the bobbin. When I reach the far end of the bobbin I tape the wire down and then I mix up some one minute epoxy. I then put a small amount of epoxy all the way around that layer of the windings. I wait a few minutes for the epoxy to kind of tack up and be sticky. Then I just repeat the entire process again, winding the next layer and epoxying. It's a bit of an art form, but after two to three coils, you start to get the hang of it. I know some of you will be curious what gauge wire I used. Uh, the truth is I tested out a bunch of different wire gauges. I mentioned earlier that the force the motor creates is related to the number of windings of the coil and the current through the coil. So you might think you can use a really fine gauge of wire and have lots of windings in a given space and have a much stronger voice coil. And that's true, but the thinner wire gauge has more resistance and thus can handle less current. Then with the thicker gauge wire, you have less windings, but you can use more current. In the end, it's actually kind of a wash depending on the force needed and the duty cycle of the magnetic coil. Needless to say, there's a whole science around optimizing the wire gauge for a magnetic coil. But for me, 28 gauge gave me the most force uh, with a maximum of three amps of current and 75 grams of total weight for the actuator. To keep these actuator comparisons fair, I want to compare these actuators to the original hobby servos, which weighed right at 75 grams each and drew about three amps of peak current. From a weight and a current standpoint, having four of these servos on an RC car already exceeded what would be ideal for like a one-tenth scale RC car, especially with uh, regards to power usage and the weight being so high up on the car. So I measured the force created by all the different coil configurations I made with a small kitchen scale. Ultimately, I found that 400 turns of 28 gauge wire created the most force at roughly 170 grams at three amps. So I assembled the entire VCM actuator with some epoxy 
and created a 3D printed mount for the Acta suspension test rig to actually mount the VCM on. I used a spring to actually hold up the 300 gram weight of the sprung mass on the test rig so it's essentially neutrally buoyant. I really only need enough force from the actuator to dampen the sprung mass's movement. Obviously 200 grams or less isn't going to be very much force, but let's see how it actually does in the real world. So controlling VCMs is very easy. I've used my favorite BTS 7960 motor driver hooked up to the voice coil and I use pulse width modulation controlled by an ESP32 microcontroller. Uh, since this is just an actuator test, the control of the VCM is strictly mathematical. Uh, the eccentric moves in a sine wave function and I just vary the duty of the PWM signal going to the motor driver based on the position of the eccentric. For positive displacement values, I pass the current through the VCM so that the actuator is actually trying to compress itself. And for negative displacement values, I reverse the direction of the current and actually try to extend the actuator. Okay, so on to the testing. The coil itself is around 5.6 ohms, and I started initially off with lower voltages just to see how it was going to perform, uh, but 6 volts and subsequently 12 volts didn't have any measurable impact on the total movement of the sprung mass. Uh, there was really nothing to be able to see there either on the camera or in the sensors, maybe a third of a millimeter of reduction. So I just jumped to the max voltage for the motor driver of 24 volts, which equates to roughly 4.3 amps of current. That's over 100 watts of power. So this tiny voice coil motor gets crazy hot, crazy fast. Uh, but we did have a bit of a result. It's not amazing, but for a 10 millimeter total suspension travel range, the sprung mass was traveling roughly three millimeters less than without the voice coil motor being turned on. So this is when I was like, what the heck is going on? I can't even run this voice coil for more than 30 seconds without overheating. And I just put the whole project aside for a month. I started down this whole rabbit hole of reading about electronic actuated active suspensions. I immersed myself reading research papers and combing through various patents on linear motors and voice coil motors. Out of all that, the most obvious thing is I don't think my voice coil in general is very efficient. There are obviously ways to manufacture the back iron that are much more effective. Uh, the air gap between the coil and the magnets at 0.4 to 0.5 millimeters is probably a little bit large. And it's not really optimized like a commercial voice coil would be, but it's hundreds of times cheaper if you ever look at those online. I also learned voice coil motors are very accurate and fast, but generally low force actuators for their actual weight, which makes sense. So I was like, how did Bose do their active suspension system? Well, it turns out that they didn't actually use linear voice coil motors at all. I think I misread some of the earlier articles where the articles were miswritten in some of the magazines. Uh, instead, they used some form of a multi-phase linear motor, uh, which is much more efficient, but more complex to build and control. Also, heat, power, and weight were issues with their suspension. There's not many details on this, but some of the research papers on hydraulic active suspensions uh, compare themselves against the Bose system, and they list a figure of around 20,000 newtons of total force for the Bose systems, whereas the hydraulic systems had orders of magnitude more force. I think this most likely means the Bose system couldn't do its cool jumping over boards trick on a continuous basis. I also don't see any evidence that the company that purchased the Bose active suspension patents, ClearMotion is working on a purely electric active suspension for cars. Um, I do see something around electrohydraulic solutions for cars, as well as for trucks actually putting in a fully electric system just in the seat itself. A couple of research papers also touched on the importance of motion ratio for electronic actuators. Uh, motion ratio is the ratio between the distance the wheel travels and the distance that the shock and spring would actually travel. The Bose system appears to utilize a McPherson strut configuration both front and rear on the LS400 which has close to a one-to-one -one motion ratio. Uh, some of the other research papers I found were using a sliding pillar suspension which again has a one-to-one -one motion ratio. I still think a purely electronic system might be viable at the RC car scale but it most likely will need to incorporate some changes.
Something like gearing or a lever arm could be used to improve the motion ratio of the suspension and increase the force at the wheels of the actuator, although the motor will have to travel further. There will most likely need to be some form of either air cooling with heat sinks or water cooling. I just don't see any way to have an effective actuator that isn't going to consume between 20 and 40 watts, and that's a lot of heat to be able to dissipate. I think the solution will also need to be some sort of three-phase motor, uh, whether that be a linear motor or a radial motor type configuration. The other arguably easier solution is an electrohydraulic system. This allows you to run a single, more efficient, large motor driving a single hydraulic pump for all four wheels. But of course, you gain the complexity of having valving, hoses, hydraulic cylinders, and a fluid reservoir. So I'm not sure which way to go right now. I obviously want to try something like a three-phase linear motor, but I know that it will be time-consuming. Uh, these kind of projects always seem straightforward on paper, but they always get more involved. Uh, you know, let me know in the comments what you guys think or if you have any other suggestions for approaches to this particular solution for actuators. So that wraps up this video. Stay safe out there.